Hello and welcome to a new lesson in communication research. I am Sakshi Mandwal and the subject expert Dr. Debarati Dhar, Assistant Professor at Vivekananda Institute of Professional Studies, Delhi. Today in this module we will be discussing about archival methods. In our previous modules we have understood about various research methodologies and their significance. In the present module we would be discussing about archival methods, its meaning and its use in communication research. The present module will discuss about archival method that is used largely in media research. Researchers can initiate their data collection by starting with either qualitative or quantitative data. There are different tools for ethnographic research. Gathering primary data is a major effort requiring significant amount of resources. Archival method deals with data collection resources like records and documents. The use of archival and secondary data sources can further the comprehensiveness of data collection, understanding of results and the cross-cultural and cross-national comparability of a specific research study. This particular module will be dealing with the definition and description of archival and secondary data sources that are both available and potentially useful in ethnographic research. Archival data can be defined as qualitative or quantitative data collected for governmental, research, education or service purposes. Records and documents are forms of materials cultures that could be written or printed or web-based evidence about institutions required for research. This material culture has two aspects. Firstly, the material aspect that exists in books and electronic recordings and secondly, the discursive aspect that exists in the form of messages or texts available for interpretation. It has been found in studies that sociologists have always been cautious of documents rather they preferred to collect data through observation or oral methods. However, by the 1980s, ethnographers were routinely acknowledging the value of documentation and archival methods. This trend of ethnography has strengthened gradually. Interestingly, historians unlike the sociologists have always used records and documents and have developed sophisticated methods for utilizing these resources. Definition of archival data. Before proceeding further, we will understand thoroughly what is meant by archival data. We will come across many texts that use the terms archival and secondary data quite interchangeably. So, for avoiding any sort of confusion, we should try and distinguish these two terms. Archival data are defined as materials originally collected for bureaucratic or administrative purposes that are converted into data for the purpose of research. On the other hand, secondary data are those data collected by researchers usually for their own research purposes, which in turn can be obtained by ethnographers for their own use either through public access or personal cooperation. Archival data can be of various types. Like, for instance, local archival data is available on overall demographic and socio-economic features of the research community like the several aspects of the population of interest to researchers such as health status or educational achievement levels. Local archival data can also be used to list the population and obtain information about social and geographical characteristics of the community under study. Local archival data can be used not only to understand the socio-demographic features but also to learn about particular domains or area of interest to researchers. A great deal of local archival information is available in almost every community. It is required on the part of the researchers to establish proper connect with institutions and organizations in order to locate these local archival sources. 
the data that is stored is often or sometimes disorganized. Data must be stored in filing cabinets and folders and required to be collected, coded and even computerized to be useful. The accumulation of such data requires considerable time and effort. Thus, in nutshell, what we understand is that it is important for ethnographic researchers to list the data for selecting the most appropriate one that is central to the study in order to structure retrieval and sampling operations efficiently. Locating Documentation We have learnt that historians sophistically deal with records and documentation. What is interesting to note is that the distinction made by most historians between primary and secondary documents is quite difficult to sustain, especially when dividing line constantly shift. Like for instance, the same document or record can be a primary source for one kind of inquiry and a secondary source for another. So in such cases, the distinction becomes very difficult. At first instance, using documents might appear to be a cheap and easy alternative to action research. However, one must understand that locating documents, gaining access and learning interpretation is not that simple and might also involve some unforeseen expenses on the part of the researcher. Documentation has its set of advantages and disadvantages. Some of the advantages of using documents produced within the institution being studied are Number 1. This particular method documents a particular moment and hence allows a researcher to follow changes in policy and practice. Number 2. Secondly, it is written in the institution's professional language which might be a part of what the researcher is studying. Number 3. Documentation is comparatively permanent and it can be consulted repeatedly. Besides the advantages, there are certain disadvantages as well and these are Number 1. Documentation may be sometimes difficult to locate or track down if the process of keeping records within the institution is flawed or in cases if the documentation has been removed over time. Number 2. If the documentation is incomplete, which is also quite a possibility, there is every chance that it will twist the analysis pretty much unknown to the knowledge of the researcher. There might be cases that the researcher while studying a particular institution might opt for using documents written from outside the institution under study. These documents could be produced by journalists, critiques, commentators of the institution. This method is relatively permanent so can be revisited and additionally it opens for deliberation over the context within which the institution operates. Public documents are available quickly, often published and distributed through public libraries with subject indices that help the researcher and also save a lot of time. Interestingly, the more private documents are usually lodged in archives and the access provisions do vary. It is the first task of the researcher to start with the reference list that he or she may have gathered on the subject under study. The researcher has to work on the identification of the data. This can be done with the assistance of key informants both within and outside the population under study. Some of the steps involved in identification of archives are Firstly, establishing who has control over access to the data. Secondly, identifying and carrying out formal and informal procedures necessary for gaining access to the data, which may include meetings, written requests for access, and going through social networks to persuade gatekeepers to provide access. Thirdly, ensuring to obtain informed consent if the data describes individual cases, developing a means for recording or copying the data and creating a strategy for organizing and storing the data. How to use archival data. In today's technological age, it is advised that when seeking archival sources, one should look up to the web first for any lead or information. Most archives require that the researcher must establish the credentials as a bona fide researcher first before using any database or collection of records. In a democratic society, government bodies are expected to open their activities for public scrutiny except in cases that concerns the security of the state. In ethnography, newspapers, journals and books are not generally referred as just a reading around a subject, but rather to the contribution that these documents can make in research data in their own right. 
However, one must take a note that it is unwise to take shortcuts through published collections of extracts. An academic researcher must find useful pointers in these types of collections as the presentation has been done from the context of the organization. Regional and local newspapers are considered important. However, the researcher must look for ways to find and validate the points through the original occurring. On the other hand, diaries and personal correspondence are often hard to locate and at times there are restrictions in their use. Such documents could be found in specialist manuscript collection of a public library or any private collection or in the collection of a local historical society etc. By now we have already understood the various steps for locating data or documentation meant for a research. So now moving further we will now discuss how a researcher must be well prepared for his visit to the site or institution for derivation of the archival data. The researcher must be well read and develop a thorough understanding both about what he or she is researching and the list of institutions he or she is intending to visit. The researcher also must develop a note or personal list regarding what he or she is expecting to get from the visit to the concerned library or institution, like what sort of information the researcher is hoping to get and what specific forms of documentation he or she wishes to consult. Many archives insist that for the preservation of fragile documentation, readers must not use pens as the documents are meant to be preserved and not to be spoiled with any marks. There might be cases when access to fragile documents is restricted or in other cases scanning or photocopying is not allowed or completely forbidden which would mean that the researcher must have additional time for taking extensive notes. The researcher must do every attempt to make the most of the archive. This can be done if one takes the advice and directions provided by the archive staffs would be helpful in getting to the best routes to the materials. The researcher must remember that every archive has its own procedures like in terms of nature of the collection for films or television programs or private papers etc. So the researcher has to work accordingly and learn the procedures for interpreting the organization or institution. Challenges in using archival data. We learned what are the starting points of getting access and derive the archival materials. So here we also need to understand or keep in mind the possible challenges. Like for instance, some files could not be found but then the researcher has to look for an alternative. Let us first understand the challenges. The archival files could have been destroyed accidentally or deliberately and there could be any possible reason for it like for instance saving office space. The files that the researcher is looking for could have been misfiled in the source institution before it reaches the archive or probably someone has used the file in the archive. The researcher must remember that most archives do not have the time or resources to search for a missing file but most are willing to do what they can supplementary to other searches and get back to the researcher if the file turns up a later date. Archival data may have several shortcomings for the purpose of study because sometimes they were or are being collected for completely different purposes. So a researcher has to keep in mind that in order to avoid wasting valued resources, it is essential to identify problems with the data in advance. So here we understand that incomplete items and missing documents are some key shortcomings in archival data. However, people who work for institutions often keep their records. So there is a possibility that documentation missing from the institutional archive may turn up in personal archives. So the researcher has to explore all possibilities. Interestingly, no archival data actually represents the study population fully. Material culture. We have learned so far that institutional research mostly produces qualitative data and archival method is a significant way of retrieving that data in ethnographic research. Now we move on to understand another important aspect of ethnographic study that is the material culture that includes not only documents and artifacts but also the non-written forms. There have been several attempts to develop a theory of material culture. However, the already developed analytic processes are most useful in understanding artifacts. For instance, the semiotics can provide a way to read an artifact as a sign within a context of signification. Written discourses are also discourses that can be subjected 
two interpretation methods such as discourse analysis or content analysis. Cognitive psychology can provide a way of understanding the social processes at play when a person uses material culture. In every case, documents must not be read as transparent record of activities, finances and institution. In fact, they are representations of how the institution wishes to present itself to the audience. It also dignifies the point that documents are stylistic conventions and formal language such as specific financial statements restrictively accessible to a researcher with proper channel and procedure. We have known that the analysis of documents is central to historical studies and debates. There are certain general principles that define historical documents or evidences quite vividly. Like documentation, all material culture has two aspects and these are Firstly, a material aspect and secondly, a discursive aspect. Artifacts have a physical existence while behavior and processes leave physical traces. On the other hand, discursive aspect comprises artifacts and the traces that are left behind by behaviors and processes and those which can be interpreted. A researcher has to rigorously examine to evaluate the credibility and authenticity of the data. It is required because sometimes in institutional research, one commonly has access to a large number of documents of different kinds and different timelines. Hence, cross-checking the data is significant for avoiding any type of shortcomings in the final analysis of the study. Further, it is also to be noted that in archival method, the concept of intertextuality exists. Each document exists in relation to other documents and these relationships could vary from Thematic, which concerns the similar issues within the institution. Chronological, which usually precedes or follows other documents. Generic, which concerns similar frame or format. Functional, which concerns serving the same purpose. Organizational, which concerns the same section or same set of people within an establishment. Hierarchical, which means dependent on each other. A researcher while gathering data may also encounter some other problems. Like for instance, the researcher might find conflicting versions of the same event in different sources. When the case of contradictory information happens, the researcher must decide how to work on the correct version or rather concentrate on understanding how and why such a contradiction has arisen and work towards sorting it. Besides intertextuality and archival data retrieval method, identification and sequencing are other parameters that a researcher must be careful about. These are important in their own ways. Sometimes it becomes immediately obvious what a document is, but there are other times when the source and the function might not be immediately obvious. So the researcher has to identify the document and its source by comparing it with other similar documents and also by testing signatures or writing styles, tracing references and dates. We have also spoken about sequencing and how important it is in organizing archives. A researcher might be collecting a large number of documents for any institutional research and sometimes the sequencing of the documents is obvious and sometimes not. It is very important to retain the order of the collected documents for appropriate analysis. We have so far discussed about the written materials. Now let us move on to the audiovisual media that is usually used in the research process by visual sociologists. Audiovisual material is generally associated with studies dealing with current social processes either by recording them in the form of photography or videos, films or by analyzing the already existing data. The media historian is generally interested in the materials produced within media institutions like television broadcasts or radio programs or maybe film or video productions etc. Archival data for studying media may also include the physical context for media like the theatre or cinema buildings which might be studied either as the evidence of history of media institutions or simply of evidence of how the media contributes more generally to cultural and social history. A cultural study researcher on the other hand might be more interested in studying the similar forms of media with the addition of newspaper and of sound of radio. It implies that either their interest lies in the material elements of culture that may be studied as they are now or they were in the past. However, what is to be noted in both the researchers is that the goals are entirely different but their preference of data and the means of gathering the data 
are quite often similar. Similarly, the reference lists in books and articles on the subject under study for any researcher can actually provide the starting point for tracing collections of material culture or rather ideas for collecting the record or data. In short, a study of the operation of an institution such as the radio or television or any film production company would require the study of its products like the films or television or radio programs. A study of regulatory or funding bodies would require research into the audio-visual productions about such institutions that are in charge of making decisions. Audio-visual archives might also consist of scripts and also the technology or the equipment such as the camera or projectors used for making and presenting the programs. Such records may be found relevant by the researcher and may take him or her to museums and other specialist collections. Conclusion This module has outlined that archival methods are a significant part of ethnographic research. It is useful in developing local theory and situating their studies locally and globally. To sum up, in this module we have learned that in an ethnographic study, archival and secondary data can contribute to initial conceptualization and substantiative data collection. The most common sources of data collection on institutions are archival records and documentation. It is most familiar with historians as compared to social scientists. However, with the relevance and acceptance of interdisciplinary studies, this method has also been adopted by the social scientists. It is up to the researcher to decide whether archival data is substantial for the study or not and then he or she has to prepare accordingly. Decisions are to be made by the researcher about allocation of time and resources required for data retrieval. The archival data retrieval process must also include considerations by the researcher such as approximately how long will it take to obtain access to the physical location where the archival information is kept or how long it will take to record the data. Besides these points, the researcher must also consider expenses for the process and work towards obtaining staff cooperation for accessing the data. In every case, the key to select the methodology will be ideally the question the researcher is seeking an answer for. Along with that intellectual framework within which the study is being conducted will also be another factor for selecting the data collection method in any research. As with documentation, the first source is library and audiovisual archives. It is the responsibility of the researcher to find ways of locating and using the archives. With this, we have come to the end of today's lesson on archival methods. That will be all for today. Thank you so much for watching and goodbye.